Most of us learn reading, writing, and arithmetic as a matter of course. But 20% pick up these skills only with tremendous difficulty. Some never learn it at all. Of these, many are highly intelligent, yet they spend their lives in a state of frustration and shame that cast a shadow over everything they try to do. They suffer from dyslexia. For over a century, scientists have known that it cripples comprehension of words and numbers, but they haven't known why. Tonight on Prime Time, we examine a radically new approach that may unlock the mystery. Dr. Harold Levinson is a clinical professor of psychiatry at the New York University Medical Center. He's also written this book, A Solution to the Riddle, Dyslexia. And with that solution, he believes that he's discovered the first effective treatment for dyslexia. Treat what? Just what exactly are its symptoms? Dyslexia is an academic scrambling disorder. Basically, what it does is it tends to scramble and prevent children from acquiring reading and writing and spelling and math functions at an appropriate age. That's all? That's all what? You can take children of extremely bright IQ, 140, 150, or 160, and they'll have difficulty remembering letters and words. They'll mix up uh, B and D and words like was and sore. They'll have difficulty remembering the sounds of letters and the sounds of letter sequences forming words. Then, then he, then he could, then he could see teeth. Feet. Willie ran up to the teeth, feet. The feet went. Went. The feet went into a horse. That's house, Danny. That's that's enough. Danny, you're just going to have to try much, much harder. Okay? Bobby, would you finish the page for Danny? Sometimes the letters and words will appear blurry and fuzzy to them, or even appear to move. They'll very often develop headaches or even dizziness while attempting to read and become frustrated and just turn off. Their writing, for example, tends to be messy and sloppy. When they try to write on a blank piece of paper, the writing will drift up or it'll drift down or it'll even look like a mountain chain. They have great difficulty keeping it on a level and keeping it spaced properly. They'll hold a pencil awkwardly. In math, they may be extremely gifted and understand concepts and yet not be able to rapidly calculate six and five without counting on their fingers. They may not be able to remember the multiplication table, six times four. They'll have to break down the six into two threes and add it up mentally in their head or again, visually constructing the numbers in their head and adding it up that way. Is this a rare affliction? No, not at all. Uh, I. As a result of screening, this whole district, 26, District 26 in Queens, estimate that approximately 20% of a middle-class population have this problem. This estimate, interestingly enough, is about what other people have estimated, either intuitively or on the basis of other testing. It was thought that many individuals outgrow this problem, uh, that is, the survivors of the problem. It turns out that nobody outgrows it. We compensate for it if we're lucky. A certain number of individuals afflicted with this particular problem fall by the wayside. They're labeled as failures, as behavior disorders, as delinquents. Uh, some even drift into drug addiction and alcoholism just to escape the horrible feeling of stupidity that every individual with this particular problem, however successful they become, has to feel. They feel frustrated and stupid. Then you have the lucky few uh, percentage uh, of individuals who, by virtue of high intelligence or compensatory mechanisms or good environments or good schooling, are able to survive it. Rockefeller, for example, was one such individual who became famous despite the fact that he had great difficulty reading and writing and spelling. And these individuals are able to make it despite their handicap, but they pay a tremendous price. And despite their success, they inwardly feel stupid a whole lifetime. And they're continuously pushing and struggling to keep from going under. This has been the sad state of affairs for almost a century. 
Dr. Levinson believes that dyslexia researchers have been stuck for all that time in the wrong part of the brain, looking for a culprit here in the cerebral cortex that processes our so-called higher thinking functions. Well, instead of there, Dr. Levinson decided to look for dyslexia's cause down in the inner ear. Here is located the body's compass system that enables us to stand up and walk, to locate ourselves in the air or on the ground, or in the vertically descending left to right world of a printed page. What happens to the message of a dyslexic as compared to somebody who had a stroke up here? What I said is that the dyslexic may be compared to a television picture that's drifting where the vertical and horizontal knobs are not working right. The picture drifts and as a result a bright brain looking at a drifting picture will have difficulty making that picture out. The device, the guided missile system, the compass that sets everything right is the inner ear system. If it sends a scrambled message to the brain the brain will not understand it no matter how bright it is, which explains very easily how come so many bright individuals may be poor readers and have academic poverty. Now let's go back to how I proved my hypothesis. What I said is that if an inner ear disturbance is at fault, then the eye movements are going to be deranged. And if I can show that dyslexics have deranged eye movements compared to normal children, then I will have proven my hypothesis. Dr. Levinson began by demonstrating that there is an eye reflex that automatically starts when a person moves past a stationary object. At slow speeds, we're able to see the sign and to read it. At a higher speed, our eyes can't grab and hold the sign long enough for word comprehension. We see a blur. Dr. Levinson theorized that for dyslexics, the sign will blur at speeds that are amazingly low compared to what normal readers can handle. Now what he needed was a device that could easily test his theory on many people. And so he designed a machine that moves images past the viewer. How do you separate with this device the dyslexic from the normal person? Very simple. If you speed up this moving sequence of elephants so that it goes faster and faster and faster and faster. There's a point where the eyes attempting to follow it just can't run any faster. The elephants run much faster than the eyes can track it. Now, it turns out that the eyes are forced to track these elephants until the eyes no longer see it. At that point, the eyes stop moving and we can physiologically get a marker as to when blurring occurs. Dyslexics blur out the elephants at very, very low speeds, surprisingly low speeds, whereas normal individuals can track the elephants at two, three, four, five, and even 10 times the speed of a dyslexic. Dr. Levinson now has what he considers to be an effective screening device. However, once he'd identified the problem, what about treating the symptoms? Producer Bev Aaron asks, what, if anything, can be done for those thousands of individuals who feel trapped in dyslexia? Motion sickness medications have been utilized for years uh, in order to alleviate the stress or effect of motion on certain selected individuals who couldn't tolerate motion stimulation. Now, I thought to myself, let's see, the inner ear and the cerebellum is known to process or to control motion input. If you have a problem and you give these individuals motion sickness medication, suddenly they control and handle motion much better than they ever did before. I said to myself, well, if the inner ear handles the visual input and the hearing input and the coordination output as it does the motion input, Maybe the medication utilized for motion sickness strengthens the whole circuitry of this system so that it not only handles motion input better, but it handles visual input better, hearing input better, and it even may be able to handle the motor output and balance and coordination output better. That is, let me try giving dyslexics anti-motion sickness medications, and let's see what effect it has. And sure enough, 
Uh, the initial study showed that about 30 to 40 percent of individuals so treated dramatically improved. By the completion of the third study recently, I was able to demonstrate that roughly 75 percent of my patients improve as a result of utilizing not only the anti-motion sickness medications, but a wide range of medications, antihistamines, even some of the antidepressants in combination. As I have gotten acquainted with more and more medications and the way they should be used and the way they should be or could be used in combination with one another, the greater my results have been. Next on Primetime, we'll meet Dr. Levinson's own daughter, Laura, whom he diagnosed as dyslexic and whose symptoms he has alleviated. We'll also meet other patients who have found a new freedom from what could have been an overwhelming handicap. Here, Dr. Levinson's 14-year-old daughter, Laura, is being tested for brainwave function by an electroencephalogram machine, a device that records the brain's electrical activity. My daughter, Laura, was in third or fourth grade, and she had been first in the class for the first three years. She was gifted in every way and had been skipped, and all of a sudden, she was no longer interested in reading. Her handwriting was atrocious, and at the time, I thought she was having an emotional difficulty in adjusting to both myself and my wife's involvement in screening this whole area for dyslexia. And I assumed that she was identifying with the dyslexic individuals I was treating to get more attention. And lo and behold, I'm watching her handwriting and I see that it's drifting and it's gobbled and I can't believe it. And then I remembered that her drawing was never all that great, even when she was younger. It was very well thought out, but the form of it was poor. But I didn't recognize it as a dyslexic symptom until three or four years later when she was in third or fourth grade, and the volume of the reading material that she had to read suddenly expanded tremendously. And I recognized several things to be important. Number one, dyslexics do not have to start out bad and then improve. They can start out as very good students, and their functioning could deteriorate and then improve again at a later point. And the emotional disturbance that you see at the time their functioning is poor isn't necessarily a cause of their learning problem, but rather a result of the learning problem. Fortunately, at that time, I had developed a medical technique for treating her, and it made my daughter's life altogether different than it would have and could have turned out otherwise. When he first explained the problem to you, was that a good feeling, or did you feel, oh, no, I'm really, I've really got something t terribly wrong here? It was a good feeling. Why? Because I was improving with my work and all. Were you relieved to find that there was something specifically wrong yeah. with you? What would you like to do now? Do you have any idea what kind of career you would like to have? I'd like to be a pediatrician. Do you think that you're going to be able to do the studies necessary to get you to that point? Yeah. Rosalind Schwartz and her daughter, Barry, were both diagnosed dyslexic by Dr. Levinson. For Rosalind, it was a long, long wait. All through her formative years, her inability to keep up in school was treated by parents and teachers as simple laziness. Although Rosalind eventually learned how to compensate for her disability, inside she knew she had a far greater potential than what her actual school grades indicated. Not being able to measure up to her own expectations, she became a typically frustrated dyslexic. Years later, when her daughter Barry's academic performance began to slip, Roslyn was determined that history would not repeat itself. Three years and many doctors later, her search for a diagnosis and treatment ended in Dr. Levinson's office. Yeah. Did you ever think it might be your fault? Yes, of course. I dropped her once as a baby. Uh, perhaps she ran a fever too high, too long. As a mother, you always look to yourself. But on the other end of it, and what kept the saneness and the balance was a lot of what she was going through, I could relate because I experienced it myself. Describe the crucial encounter with Dr. Levinson. We knew just from the questions that he was asking that, aha, there is a problem now. How severe is it? How can it be controlled? How will it affect the rest of her life? How will it affect her feeling about herself? When he, told, when he answered those questions, was there a feeling of relief? 
There's a certain feeling of relief, definitely. But you look, the, the prognosis down the road, of course, then becomes how will we handle, and ha how do we handle it. My problem was I did not want to bury on medication. What happened after you began taking the medication um, that Dr. Levinson prescribed to you? Everything was almost 100% better. Was, I, it, was it, I mean, when was it 100% better? Immediately afterwards? Well, I remember we were, I, saw, I was able to read and understand what I was reading, I was able to um, really grasp what I was reading. Within uh, a day, within hours after taking the medication? I don't know. I don't, oh. all I know is that I was, all of a sudden it just seemed like I was like everyone else. I knew what I was reading. I was able to comprehend everything. Did it you was, want to ra run around and just tell the whole world I can, I'm normal? I did. <laughs> and I'm, I play softball and I remember the first couple of years I just I was a very bad player. Now I think I'm a rather good player. I enjoy it. I still play, and I like it a lot, and I'm a lot better. How are you doing in school? In school, I have about an 85 average, and I'm holding it well. You're one of the brains now. Huh? No. <laughs> no. 85 sounds pretty good. Thank you. It was horrible. I just couldn't cope with it. All the kids were saying that I wasn't that smart. I just couldn't cope with it. I was my teacher didn't understand it, and she kept on yelling at me. I just couldn't cope with it. Could you remember wanting to read? Yes, I yes I did. I want to learn. I want to read, but it kind of was like a wall pushing me back. What was it like when you would try to see a sentence with words in it? Well, I don't really remember it. It was kind of normal to me. I didn't really understand how come it was different. How did you deal with this problem? I, it was a great sense of relief to find Dr. Levinson and have it diagnosed because beforehand you could see other children that came to play at the house when they drew or crayoned. It was completely different than his. Um, anything they could do, they could tie their shoes, they could do anything, and so many things he couldn't do. It was, it was terribly frustrating to wonder why you weren't able to teach him, why you weren't able to help him. Did you sense that he was a bright kid? Yeah, I, definitely. Something Did you get angry with him sometimes for? Frustrated, like you'd give him a, something to do, go to your room and bring down a blue book. And he would forget to do it before he left the room. You couldn't understand why. He was an intelligent individual. You didn't know if he was being lazy or just ignoring you. Yes. Your experience with dyslexia, what would you say to parents, other parents who have children with these same kind of problems? Get help and the sooner the better. The, he's a much happier child. He copes much better with little frustrations that used to seem like a stick of dynamite, a tremendous problem to him that would just explode on him. Now he's a much more contented person, and I hope he'll have a future of happiness. You think you can have a future of happiness? Mm-hmm. I think I do. <laughs> Another startling finding that comes out of Dr. Levinson's work has to do with phobias. Many of his dyslexic patients complain quite consistently about their own phobias. They feared heights, became easily disoriented, didn't like to travel fast, dreaded enclosed spaces, and on and on. For the dyslexic, a typical amusement park thrill ride was no fun, it was a nightmare. Dr. Levinson concluded that their phobias were no imaginary hang-ups, but were produced by a malfunctioning compass system inside their inner ears. And in fact, when his patients began taking anti-motion sickness medication, not only did their academic work improve, but their phobias decreased in intensity, or they disappeared completely. Phobias, um, you find that they're associated with dyslexia? Definitely. Do you have any phobias? Yes, what? I have a fear of height. Uh, I don't mind like being in a plane or something because then I'm enclosed and my feet are on the ground and I'm not looking out like straight down. But wing walking is out. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I went to Washington D.C. and they have a ten-story escalator. I don't know if any of you have ever seen it. And I went up it, really trembling, but wanting my kids who wanted to go to go and not showing them that I was afraid. Down, I took the elevator. I just stood near the top and looked down and like my heart sunk. Other you know? phobias? Yeah. I used to be afraid of driving long distances myself because I found that sometimes my concentration would vary. But I found that with the medication. My concentration was much better. Moving down the line here, do you have phobias? A lot of them. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I cannot take oral direction and then follow it in a car. There's no way. 
What's even worse is, well, come, I'll show you on a map. You lose me totally. So you're the so kind unless, of person who turns to the person sitting next to you and said, get that? Did you get right, that? Exactly. Because unless I've been there myself and driven it myself, there's no way I'm going to find it a second time. Suppose someone comes up and says, um, do you know where uh, 318 Green Street is? Mm -hmm. Can you, and, and even if you knew, could you direct them to that? I would really have to concentrate on it, and if it wasn't involved with making too many lefts or too many right turns, I might, might, I wouldn't rely on me if I were you, but I might get them there. What kind of new world for a dyslexic do you envision? I think it's a whole new world for a dyslexic because now children will be able to screen, be screened for this disorder before they even start school. Parents and teachers will know that a certain percentage of children will have it. They'll understand the problem. The children who are prone to developing this problem can be taught to understand it. Just the knowledge of knowing why you can't, why you can't do this, or why you can't compete, and why you're clumsy in sports, and why you can't learn to read the way the other kids has a tremendous beneficial psychotherapeutic effect. And if the medications can hold these children over for a couple of years until their own mechanisms, compensatory mechanisms, develop, it means that the emotional scarring, the behavior disorders, the dropouts, the delinquency that ordinarily occurs may be significantly minimized. Next week on Primetime, Eleanor Jones tells us how she went from being a retired school teacher to being the author of best-selling novels whose violence is historically accurate and whose romance is physically graphic. Then, these karate students demonstrate what they've learned through years of practice as they take their final exam, which they hope will lead to the awarding of a black belt. For Primetime, I'm Jim O'Brien. Good evening. spend their lives planning what they think will someday come but it never does they just don't let it happen they wait for tomorrow thinking life will soon get started but here's what I've grown to know it's right now that I'm living it's the prime time of my life Doing what I always dreamed I'd do Feeling free and being me In the prime time of my life Fear is wrong and change is also right I gotta keep my dreams Right inside in the prime time of